Welcome to the Speaking Citizen. This is an ongoing series on creative writing, art, and culture. Today, our guest is Rakshanda Jalil, prolific uh, writer. Ra Rakshanda is also a critic and literary historian. Her PhD on the progressive writers' movement, as reflected in Urdu literature, is of great interest to people, especially people in Lucknow where the movement was inaugurated in the 1930s. For those interested in the same movement, for those who want to know more about the progressive writers movement, they can pick up uh, Rakshanda's research work, which is now a book published by Oxford University Press in 2014 with the title, Liking Progress, Loving Change. Rakshanda is founder of Hindustani Awaz. This is a unique um, organization devoted to Hindi Urdu literature and culture. Lovers of art and culture are familiar with her countless book reviews, opinion pieces, travel logs, and discussions on television. So uh, I welcome Rakshanda to Speaking uh, Citizen. And um, my first question to you is about your study, I believe at the moment you're working on Indian secularism. Tell us, tell us what your study, we've heard a lot uh, um, about secularism as defined by politics and the politicians of the day. Now you tell us uh, what your study says about secularism. Um. Thank you, Meru. Uh, it's a pleasure to be meeting you and talking to you, meeting you in virtual space, however. Um, first, I must clarify, this is not really a study. Um, I don't, I think, I think Wikipedia decided to put it down as a study, but it's an ongoing interest. Uh, it's an interest that manifests itself in many ways. In the titles and books I choose to uh, translate, in the things I look out for while um, writing book reviews, in the opinion pieces I write, in my own study, in the many uh, books that I, um, uh, that I put together and edit. So secularism has been a running concern uh, for a very long time. Um, I don't see a secularism as the absence of religion. I see uh, secularism defined by an expression that actually puts it together very nicely in an ideal world. And that expression is living together separately, which means that you have your faith, I have mine, but it need not become a conflict zone between us. Uh, um, India, I think, cannot define secularism in the way France and Algeria and other countries have, or which Turkey tried to do, but no longer with the Islamization now happening. But other countries have attempted to have a church state divide as it were. Uh, I think, to that extent, yes, governments really ought to be um, sort of a-religious. There should be an absence of religion on the part of government bodies, institutions, even even um, the something as basic as which we've all seen and which is problematic, and we allowed it to go unchecked, and that is why it's it's become uh, the monster that it has. Um, many years ago, we thought it was perfectly benign when a Xerox machine was bought in the in the office and a little puja was done or a sthapna was done for a new foundry or foundation stone or a little building. And we thought it was okay to have a little puja, you know. But I think that is where maybe some of us should have been more alert. Maybe some of those small things that were happening where, where religion was being institutionalized whether it was in the part of government or agencies or even institutions, even private institutions that some of us have worked for, we allowed all of it to go unchecked. And today we see this, and I take, I lose no opportunity in calling out the elephant in the room, which I think is the conjoined twin of secularism, which is communalism, right? So I think communalism is no longer something that we, we can push to the margins of our consciousness and say that, okay, we are all right, but there's a certain kind of person who is not or who's, who's communal. I think communalism is all around us. And I think it's a grave uh, uh, concern to all of us. 
So um, I, I'm not a politician. I'm not a, a sort of policy maker. I can't do things at, at an institutional level. I'm only a writer. So the tools I have at my disposal are just words. I can use them. Um, be that, uh, be it be uh, plucking uh, works of translation. For instance, uh, there's this novel written by Christian Chandar, it's called Ghaddar, Trita. Uh, I published it some years ago. Um, it was, it, it is located in this, in 1947, even though it was written in the 60s, it's about partition, but it's so applicable to us. As a nation, uh, the communalism that tore us apart that drove such a wedge between communities. For 70 years, it's allowed, been allowed to grow unchecked. If, if anything, it's big and more monstrous than it was in 47. So I chose uh, Krishna Chandra's Avadar for the simple reason that I think that 70 years later, we've not learned the lessons that a novel like this was trying to point towards. That anybody who stands away from the crowd and has an opinion that is different from the mob is considered a radar, a traitor. So I can go on about uh, secularism and communism, which I see as two sides of the same coin. But uh, yeah, I, th I think it's it, 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 it ought to concern more of us than it is at present. So um, uh, tell me, Rakshanda, secularism is not a really bad word, is it? As it is being projected oh, in this day and age. In fact, uh, our founding fathers, uh, Nehru and his generation of men, uh, took secularism to be the cornerstone of the kind of democracy that we were supposed to have built for ourselves, you know, after 47 and sec uh, socialist secular republic. We dropped socialist somewhere along the way with the opening up of the economy and this and that. But very much uh, socialism was very much a part of, uh, you see it everywhere. I had a friend, uh, Meru, visiting from one of the erstwhile uh, 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 U USSR, and uh, I was taking her around Delhi, and I was pointing out neighborhoods to her, and I was saying, this is a government a colony, this is a government uh, uh, housing society, and she was like, I'm coming from the former uh, USSR, and we don't have any such thing, and that's when it occurred to me that how socialist we were to begin with, right? Mm. We were also secular to begin with. So somewhere along the way, we've been shedding these, uh, these very, very important uh, aspects of our identity as a nation. And that is very alarming, I think. So uh, do you think lofty ideas, idealistic ideas like secularism and socialism also need lofty and... Um, uh, very, uh, very refined minds to put these uh, beautiful ideas into practice. Is the problem that we don't have minds like uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and uh, um, uh, M.K. Gandhi to actually uh, put these beautiful, um, uh, almost utopian ideas into practice? Is that our present day problem? I don't, uh, uh, would not want to use the word lofty and refined mind at all. I would want to say that these were actually commonplace practices. They were practiced uh, by ordinary people. When I use the word living together se uh, separately, I think that was a way of life for centuries. Uh, people had their, their own kitchens. They may or may not have chosen to eat in each other's homes. They may or may not have given their daughters in marriage to each other, but they lived together in reasonable harmony and amity. And that is the way I understand secularism. I don't see it as a particularly lofty, noble, high-minded idea. I think it's, it's entirely possible for it to be a lived reality. Uh, and so I don't think we need high minds or refined minds. I think we just need sane minds. So why do you think we are unable to practice secularism and uh, socialism in its in its um, in its spirit um, uh, today. No socialism. There is a whole uh, political uh, economic theory for it. You know, almost 
I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not really equipped to comment on that. But I mean, we we, we did open up during our Rao's time. We did allow um, all sorts of uh, companies to invest in India for an, for indirect investments, this and that. We opened up, and we have growing up. I think it must have been the same in your childhood. If you went looking for a shampoo, you had three brands, all Indians. If you wanted to buy a car, you had two two brands both being manufactured in India. So for all our commodities, all our consumer goods, we were a pretty self-reliant nation. We decided to open up and so on. And so with that, I mean, it's a long story, but put briefly, socialism kind of leached out of our lives, our, our industries, which were government owned, were privatized, so on and so forth. Let's not get there, but let's stick to what, what I am able to sort of understand and comment on, which is what happened to secularism? Why did we allow it to sort of um, drop away as it were? I think, I think uh, uh, um, there are some defining moments. Uh, I, I see the Rath Yatra uh, as a very defining moment. I see that as, a, uh, as, an, as an event that mobilized large numbers of people towards a idea, um, towards an idea that was not in, in the spirit of secularism. And uh, with, with the Rath Yatra, we began to see how uh, it began to legitimize a kind of a majoritarianism. And that majoritarianism was not in consonance clearly with secularism. So secularism, uh, socialism, and of course, as you said, flip side of the same coin is communalism. Um, how does a literary person look at communalism? You know, we've heard politicians um, and sociologists define communalism. And after 1947, it was believed that we can only go forward after that tragedy that India can only look ahead. But today, communalism forces itself into our home, our mind and heart. How do you think did we regress so? Okay, I can only comment as somebody who lives in the world and deals with, with, with words. If you'll allow me to just walk across to my shelf, I'm gonna get you a book that is my attempt to address this issue. Give me a minute. Is it Pigeons of the Domes? Yes, it is, it is, it is. This is the book, uh, it's called Pigeons of the Dome. Yes. Uh, it looks, it's an edited volume. Uh, I've written a long introduction. Uh, I've called it Stories on Communalism. And I've written a long introductory essay dealing with exactly the sort of things we are now talking about, about how secularism and, 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 and uh, communalism are conjoined twins. But what I have tried to do is uh, use the skills I have at my disposal, which is I work between languages. I look at Urdu, Hindi, um, English. I have friends who help me with Punjabi and so on. So what we went looking for was uh, the 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 a communal thread or, or rather the thread of uh, of differences and uh, differences actually can be celebrated also there is no reason really to uh, to make differences a cause for uh, discord uh, growing up in my childhood uh, we celebrated every uh, festival holi diwali christmas everything i had neighbors who would invite me to sit on the lakshmi in the lakshmi puja in their home we played holi with them we put out uh, you know uh, clay lamps and diyas and burst crackers on diwali they came to our house for for eid and so on so differences need not be a reason uh, to to sow discord in an ideal world and i think um, uh, in my childhood, which still had vestiges of a very Nehruvian India, we were able to celebrate those. But before, before the shared childhood that we grew up in, there was 1947. Yes, but uh, I'm willing to see 1947 as a blip. Uh, I think uh, other countries, other nations have learned from history and sworn or not to go back to making those mistakes. I think uh, we as a nation did not learn the lessons that were there, that was the writing on the wall after 47. In, uh, we, we ideally should have said that no, never again, the message 
came out of the Holocaust, if you recall, uh, you know, was let's not forget, let us not do this ever again, you know. And that was the, the profound message that came out of the Holocaust and, and, and all of that. But uh, I think we in India had the opportunity of something similar. We could have told ourselves, no, never again. We chose not to for some reason. I think we, 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 we had a, a fairly sort of uh, two decades of nation building where our attention was diverted. I'm not saying there were no criminal riots during the first 20 years after 47. Yes, there were. But by and large, people put their shoulder to the wheel and said, okay, let's get on now uh, with, with the business of building the nation. And everybody was interpreting it in this different ways. The film lyricist was also telling people. And remember, cinema was a very big medium at that point. So the cinema of the 50s is saying, Chodo kal ki baatein, kal ki baat purani, aao milkar likhe nai kahani. I think this was the message that was blowing in the wind in the 50s and the 60s, possibly, right up till the 60s, I would say. We had our wars, we had the war with China, we had the wars with Pakistan, but I would go so far as to say that by and large, uh, the, the real focus was on nation building, on putting ourselves on a trajectory of growth, of, of self-reliance and so on. And Nehru was saying, uh, let the temples of modern India be the schools and the colleges and the factories and the dams, right? I just wanted to make this um, uh, update the intervention by saying, I don't know how much uh, uh, Europe has uh, actually uh, learned uh, after the uh, Second World War, you know, with uh, the confrontation between NATO and uh, yeah. Russia today. Um, I don't know what we are in for, you know, yeah. we might be um sitting on the edge of a uh, third world war we don't know so uh, yes of course you know pigeons of domes was um, reviewed in the citizen it's a beautiful beautiful book and my uh, uh quest next question to you was exactly that that um, you know, to, you have talked about the dangers of communalism and how destructive it can be for all of us in this book. And yet we, we are so, we feel so threatened as a society by communalism today. So if you want to add to what you uh, already were saying. No. I just can't labor the point enough that there are, there have been lessons of brutality of, of madness uh, but we've always said it's the madness of the times and then we've moved on and we've we pretended that you know uh, we had Gujarat um, 20 years um, later uh, we seem to be suffering from an amnesia so um, I think these are uh, this sort of collective amnesia the silence that is increasingly adopted by a majority. Um, I think these are problematic issues. Uh, I'll go back to Nazi Germany and say that uh, Germany did pay a very heavy price for the silence of its majority. Uh, is that what we want for ourselves today? Mm. Now, uh, um, we talked a bit about uh, prose and literature, uh, language now. Urdu, Urdu played such a vibrant role during the freedom struggle in the 20th century. Uh, where does the usefulness of the language uh, lie in contemporary society? Uh, does the language, I mean, it almost um, by inventing in Kalabs in Dabad, it, uh, it was uh, like the language playing such a powerful uh, role as a freedom fighter in the freedom struggle. So what is the state of the language now? Is it just uh, Sher or Shairi and Mushaira or does it still have a potential to make um, creative changes in society? You know, till not very long ago, till living memory, at least uh, the generation that you and I belong to, Urdu was pretty much around us. Of course, there was cinema, which has played a huge role in popularizing Urdu. Uh, but also, um, if you recall, uh, when uh, the f uh, Indian astronaut went into space, and we all saw it on Doordarshan, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, the prime minister, is asking, Wahan se Bharat kaisa dikhta hai? And this astronaut is saying, Sare jahan se achha hindustan hamara. 
And it was natural. I don't think it was prompted. I don't think it was tutored. It came naturally uh, for generations, for decades, when the finance uh, minister presented the budget in parliament, he invariably used a share or several shares. And this was almost a tradition, an unspoken tradition. Uh, and this went on when you needed to say something pithy in a few words, the haiku-like compactness of the share of the Urdu ghazal and the Urdu share lent itself very naturally to people. So whether it was a revolutionary or the uh, or the or the or the or the lover or or the politician or anybody in, in the public uh, space or the private space, you know, uh, the idea of being able to convey a great deal through few words was something that the Urdu poetry allowed a cross section of people. And I think this was pretty much around us. Of course, finance ministers do not present the budget anymore with Shiru Shairi. But having said that, every now and then we are surprised by somebody or the other resorting to uh, Urdu Shairi in parliament, even our prime minister who's been known to use a share, he used Nida Fazli share recently. Uh, so, uh, that is the beauty of Urdu, um, that uh, it, it, the most unlikely people end up using it because it comes so naturally and to say so much. Naturally, Zati uh, Zindigi may be or public Zindigi may be speeches, election rallies may parliament may Hajagas the Matia Jasaka. Having said that, I think we are reaching a point where uh, the population or the numbers of those who know Urdu or speak Urdu or use it in some way or the other, in, in some form or the other, is increasing. But the number of people read it in the script is certainly declining. So it's a, it's a very sort of a, a wonky um, a, a proportion. Um, now, the question that troubles me is, will Urdu survive in the way it has in the absence of a script? Will it be uh, once it's been Romanized or it's been uh, accessed through Devnagari? Uh, what will happen to Urdu and its sounds? Because Devnagari does not have certain sounds. Uh, English similarly is not able, Roman uh, is not able to replicate those sounds. So what do you do when you splice a language from its script? What do you do when you dilute or replace the original sounds with others, the ren, the af, these sounds are not there. So how do you, how do you then, uh, what kind of Urdu will it be? Uh, these are troubling questions, no easy answers. But I personally think, to answer your question, I personally think that the interest in Urdu per se is growing. Mm -hmm. It is growing through content-based uh, programming. More and more programming, sahi or galat share, uh, some of the, the, the awful stuff we get as WhatsApp forwards, uh, share that are attributed to Ghalib or uh, Gozar Sahib or, you know, all sorts of people, um, they're often inaccurate. But I would rather not be a language uh, purist and see the, uh, the other thing that emerges from this abundance of Urdu everywhere. Clearly, there's an interest. Clearly, there are people who think that this, uh, uh, the poet's job, really, and Ghalib said it so beautifully, and that has been the primary function of the Urdu poet all along, to have a finger to the pulse of society, to be able to say what people say. Uh, at, at some point, somebody or the other has felt it, and I should be able to say it compactly. And I think people dip into this, people dip into the river of Urdu and pluck things that suit them as and when. They may not read it correctly, they may not read it in the script. These are other matters. I think, uh, would you agree that uh, Urdu, the Urdu script in particular, stands at the same crossroads as uh, Persian, for example, you know, when, uh, when uh, the Persian world was uh, colonized by the Arabic world and the Arabic script 
uh, seeped into the literary uh, world of the Persians. And um, they had to give up their script, but they, uh, they, they saved their language. <coughs> and uh, then of course, you know, the, the pangs of people like Ghalib who had to let go of the Persian influence uh, uh, on uh, the literature and poetry in India and, uh, and give way to the Urdu script. <laughs> this has happened. Um, uh, uh, Meru, you're very right in pointing out that civilizations and scripts have had a conjoined relationship in terms of their rise and fall. And there have been instances, uh, be it the Turkish language, the which which was part of the large Turkish caliphate. Uh, it has happened to Persian, as you say, but closer home, it happened to Sanskrit. There have been these large cycles. Sanskrit was replaced by Persian. Persian was replaced by Urdu, you know, in a, in a, in, in a large cyclical manner. So yes, of course, we've seen that um, um, somebody uh, like, uh, let's say, Abdul Rahim Khan Khana, one of the nine jewels in Akbar's court, um, uh, gave himself the task of translating. I consider Abdul Rahim Khan Khana as one of the patron uh, saints virtually of uh, modern day translators such as myself, because Abdul Rahim Khan Khana understood the importance of, of creating literary bridges. So the Sanskrit texts that were then available, but was numbers were declining those people who could read them, he had them translated into Persian, right? So they survived in a sense and many of those texts, many of those, uh, those, those ancient Puranas were translated into Persian and that's how they came to us. They are now in, in libraries and archives. And then from Persian, they were translated into Urdu, into Hindi, into Hindi and so on. So such is the nature of, uh, of languages and the cycles that they, they, they form, um, which is why I think translations are important because they, 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 they allow languages to, uh, well, remain alive in, in another form, in another garb, uh, but nevertheless, the essence remains. Also, uh, when uh, somebody like you translates so beautifully from the Urdu into English, uh, then a lot of um, English reading uh, people get interested in Urdu. And maybe, you know, they, uh, there is a desire to learn Urdu and to read the literature translated by you um, in its original language. I hope so. I hope uh, this business of the script that we talked about, um, I hope uh, that uh, is, is resolved through this, that for instance, um, I was at a seminar just sitting in and listening and there was somebody reading a paper based on my translation uh, of Intezar Hussain's novel, uh, The Sea Lies Ahead. It's part of a trilogy about Pakistan and the problems it's had. So I translated uh, that some years ago and this person who's a young academic was reading a paper based on that translation. I had two problems with that. One, uh, that person did not acknowledge the translator at all. So treated it as though it came fully formed from somewhere. I think that effacement of the translator is problematic because you need to acknowledge the sources. You need to acknowledge that you have read it in such and such person's translation. That is one thing. Publishers now are doing a great service for uh, translators. They give them credit on the front page. If you recall the Penguin classics that we read uh, during our youth, uh, the Penguin Classics never carried the translator's name because if it was a Homer or it was a it was a Plato, that was enough. And the translator's name in the Penguin Classics was hidden somewhere in the in the second or the third page. Uh, now that is not happening. Publishers are giving us that space on on the on the cover. Uh, that is all very well, but I think the kind of intellectual subterfuge that you see uh, sometimes take place, the the lack of acknowledgement. I think uh, that is problematic. But to come back to your question, um, uh, you, you say whether this will open a way back to the original text. Ideally, yes. But for many people, there is always a plan B. Why read uh, a book 
such as for example intezar husain's uh, aage samandar hai in urdu itni mushkil kyun uh, uthaye ke urdu seekhe urdu padhe there is a plan b in place which is ke devnagari mein to ye hai hi available aap kyun na use pad lijiye so uh, main iske pros aur cons dono dekhti hu mujhe samajh mein aata hai ke uh, zaruri ye hai text padha jaye original text padha jaye uh, ab wo ओरिजिनल जबान में नहीं पढ़ा जा रहा यानी उर्दू में नहीं पढ़ा जा रहा है हिंदी में पढ़ा जा रहा है कम से कम पढ़ा जा रहा है आई सी दैट एंड आई एम थैंकफुल फॉर दैट बट आइडियली क्या ही अच्छा होता कि अगर स्पेशली द पर्सन हु वाज रीडिंग द पेपर यस्टरडे एन एकेडमिक हु वांट्स टू प्रेजेंट अ पेपर ऑन द सब्जेक्ट इफ एट लीस्ट एकेडमिक्स इफ नॉट द ले रीडर वुड टेक द ट्रबल टू लर्न द लैंग्वेज दैट दे आर you know writing a whole phd thesis on then why not actually go back and this is a problem i have often uh, i was a uh, on a on a viva of a phd student and that, that person was doing something on manto's radio plays and other plays in uh, which were which i know were only to be found in urdu but that person had just not accessed the original urdu sources mm-hmm. i feel uh, that is um, Uh, laziness on the part of uh, at least serious readers at least serious researchers i i, I don't expect the lay reader who walks into bari sans to pick up a work of translation to take the trouble of then going back and reading the original that is asking for a lot one is thankful that they are reading translations from indian languages and and that's fine but for the serious reader i think uh, or the serious researcher or the the serious uh, uh, student of 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 that particular text i think yes they they really need to take that little extra trouble and read the text in the original script of course ideal situation ideal. Uh, tell me rakshandar uh, around you today do you see the seeds or a branch or even a tree of a literary cultural movement as powerful as the progressive writers movement that may help to enlighten society like it did in the last century alas no mehru kya hi acha hota agar aisi koi cheez hoti chahe fledgling hoti mujhe islands pe khade hue writers nazar aate hain when main jab apne ird gird dekhti hu koi sorority koi fellowship koi fellow travelers ki feeling hai hi nahi koi salab nahi hai koi salab to bahut dur ki baat hai salab ke liye ek dev honi chahiye एक एक बड़ी लहर होनी चाहिए तब सैलाब बनता है लहर तो मुझे नजर ही नहीं आ रही uh, मुझे कोई एक कंसर्टेड एफर्ट एक रीचिंग आउट अक्रॉस पिकेट फेंसेस ऑफ लैंग्वेजेस भाषा राइटर्स के बीच में हम जाते हैं लिटफेस में हम अपना सेशन करके आ जाते हैं हमारी बहुत कम जबकि ये हमें मौके फराम किए जाते हैं लिटफेस से बेहतर मौका क्या होता है कि आप जबानों में के बीच में क्रॉस फर्टिलाइजेशन इंकरेज करें गवर्नमेंट एजेंसीज जो सेटअप की गई थी स्पेशली नेहरू के इंडिया में जैसे कि साहित्य अकेडमी है उसका तो एजेंडा ही ये था कि क्रॉस फर्टिलाइजेशन हो एंड आई यूज द वर्ड एजेंडा एडवाइजली बिकॉज इट वॉज अ लिट डाउन यू नो इट वॉज पार्ट ऑफ द्रेडो एज इट वर्क वो लोग करते रहते हैं अपना काम अब भी कर रहे हैं लेकिन राइटर्स के लेवल पे मुझे कोई बहुत बड़ी वेव तो दूर की बात है कोई कंसर्टेड एफर्ट भी नजर नहीं आता जहाँ लोग कहें कि चलिए हम साथ चलने की कोशिश करते हैं हम कॉमन कंसर्न ढूंढते हैं नीचक रिएक्शन होते हैं मुरुगन पेरुमल ने, ने कहा कि मैं कुछ नहीं करूंगा कुछ नहीं लिखूंगा तो लोगों ने सॉलिडारिटी एक्सप्रेस की या आपको याद होगा अवार्ड वापसी की एक लहर उठी थी वो दब गई लहर लेकिन उस वक्त हमने कुछ कुछ चीजें सुनी तो ये सब स्कैटर्ड इंसिडेंट्स हम हम आइडेंटिफाई कर सकते हैं वी कैन पुट दैम ऑन अ मैप Oh, we can't join those dots at least but individuals also play such a important role you know in moments of crisis like aapne uh, biography likhi hai dr rashid jahan pe rebel and her cause uh, so you don't see any dr rashid jahan around you uh, today i see an arundhati roy and i see uh, an ashok wajpai and i see morgan perumal i see them as isolated instances i don't see them as part of a big movement rashi jahan's greatest good fortune was not just that she was a remarkable woman in her own right but she was born at a time when there was a sense of fellowship when there was a sense of of course there was the movement that 
lent itself very naturally, the Progressive Writers Movement, the Progressive Writers Association, the Indian People's Theatre Association, IPTA, all of which that um, Rashid Jahan belonged to. But I think us waqt ke mahal mein koi cheez thi, us fiza mein kuch tha, ke a log saath milke kaam karna chaate the. Majaz, aapke shahar ke majaz ke baare mein kaha jata tha that a kheeks was born to Urdu, uh, but progressive bheđiye unne utha ke le gai. तो वो एक माहौल था जहां आप एक 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 तरह से सोच सकते थे आपकी अपनी सोच में भी तब्दीलियां आती थी आप एक उस उस लहर का हिस्सा बन सकते थे मुझे जैसा मैंने कहा शुरू में क्योंकि मुझे लहर ही नहीं नजर आ रही है तो मैं कहां से देखूं लोग जो अपना रंग बदल रहे हैं या अपना अपने को उस लहर में ढा के उसके साथ बहना चाह रहे हैं सो डू यू थिंक नॉट इनफ पीपल realize or feel the urgency you know to to uh, to make changes in society today you know there was an urgency in the 20th century yeah. to unitedly fight the british and to end colonialism in yeah. india but why is there no urgency no urgent response or movement to rising communalism to hate speech to uh, people wanting to um, kill another human being with their naked hands lynching why don't why don't we feel that these are urgent enough uh, reasons to come together and to to fight unitedly against uh, such criminal activities we have knee jerk responses to something very outrageous like the rape of the little girl in jammu or something like that or the recent incident in hatras so we all our responses appear to be in the nature of knee jerk responses we keep uh, we we're not sufficiently outraged to come together we keep our interest and our passion for other things i see a movement for let's say organic food hmm? people will go to ridiculous lengths to get organic strawberries from mahabalipuram or somewhere like that right or they'll go to the far ends of the city to buy a certain kind of organic jaggery which is only to be found in a certain place i think this is a consumerist society where we are interested in commodities not in ideas um, that's an awful thing to say really but uh, maybe that would explain why we keep our passion and our our zeal for things uh, you know we will we will um, somebody says you know the the shop that's open that stocks the finest coffee from here there and and we'll make the trek to the other end of town to check out that shop but we will not expand the same sort of zeal and energy and empathy we might change our facebook profile to uh, you know when that uh, charlie hebdo thing happened we changed our facebook profiles but what are these do they amount to anything do they amount to anything beyond a very sort of momentary passing outrage of- do you think uh, literature is letting down um, present day society no i wouldn't say that uh, uh, that would be a really sorry and shameful thing uh, when i when i edited this book and this was not, not a very long time ago it was just a few years ago so it's not as though i didn't find enough material it's not like i had to go back to the mantos and the krishnachandras and the bedis i was able to find perfectly topical uh, stories by the present lot of writers abdul samad zakia mashadi you know all of these people so no uh, in fact there was this lovely story um, if you were to allow me to very briefly tell you what the story is it's located it's located um, we are not told the name but we are assuming this is bombay um aap jante honge ki parsi cops bearers hain jo tower of silence mein lash ko leke jate hain even mm-hmm. after the bath and everything the family is not allowed to be at be a part uh, of that journey so it is only the the cops bearers who carry it on a bear to the tower of silence so ek parsi do parsi hain jo ek lash ko leke tower of silence ja rahe hain ab wo dekhte hain aasman ki taraf jab wo lash ko rakhte hain tower of silence mein wo aasman ki taraf dekhte hain koi cheel gird kauve nahi hai jaisa ki aap jante hain ki parsi mazhab mein it is the, the the vultures and the birds of prey that pick the bones clean of the body and the body is then there is no burial there is no cremation in that sense so jab wo aasman mein dekhte hain to unko koi aasman saaf hai koi cheel gird kauve kuch nahi hai they are very perplexed then khabar ye aati hai 
کے شہر میں بلوا ہوا ہے اور بہت خون قتل و غارت ہوئی ہے اور ندیاں بہ رہی ہیں خون کی سڑک پہ لاشیں پڑی ہوئی ہیں تو سمجھ میں یہ آتا ہے کہ آج دلچرز بزی ہیونگ اے فیسٹ نا دس از اے ویری ویری small and short story but when i read it i got goosebumps this man this writer is not writing in the way of a manto or a krishna chandar or a or a bedi or any of the partition the hayatullah ansaris and all the other partition generations or generation of writers who concentrated on the blood and the gore he makes no mention of that he is just alluding to the absence of the vultures and how they're busy having a feast mm-hmm. on the streets of the city Now, is this not a political story? Is this not a politically, socially conscious story? Of course it is. It just uses a different way to address that issue. So I wouldn't go so far as to say that uh, this kind of political awareness, social awareness, awareness of social injustice has gone out of uh, the writer's realm. No, it hasn't. It's just taken another way. If you give me another example, in this collection, there is a story. اگین شہر کا نام نہیں دیا ہوا ہے شہر میں کرفیو ہے اور لوگوں کو کہا جاتا ہے ایک اناؤنسمنٹ ہوتا ہے کہ اتنی دیر کے لیے کرفیو لفٹ کیا جائے گا آپ میں سے جو لوگ مسجد میں جا کے نماز پڑھنا چاہیں آپ جا سکتے ہیں بشرط یہ کہ آپ اپنے گھروں سے نکلے ہاتھ اٹھا کے تو لوگ نکلتے ہیں ہاتھ اٹھا اٹھائے اپنے گھروں سے ہاتھ اٹھائے ہوئے وہ مسجد میں جاتے ہیں افسوس یہ ہے مہرو کہ وہ سزا بھی ہاتھ اٹھا کے کرتے ہیں ناؤ what does it say and, and the, the story ends like this mm. i think uh, like the previous story that i mentioned to you i think it's a very powerful story it talks about fear it talks about uh, a community being subdued beyond all human limits it talks about a whole lot of things by saying very few things so i think the political writer uh, uh, sorry the urdu writer be it out of political correctness or um, uh, i don't know they unka mizaj lehja badal gaya hai lekin unke concerns nahi badle agar unke concerns bhi badal gaye hote tab hame bade afsos ki baat aur sharmindagi ki baat hoti lekin mujhe nahi lagta hai ki unke concerns badle hain mujhe lagta hai kehne ka tarika badla hai wo to lazim hai koi koi zaruri nahi hai ki sab log ek hi tarah se likhe koi zaruri nahi hai ki 70 saal pehle manto ne jis tarah se communalism ka zikr kiya آج کا رائٹر بھی اسی طرح سے لکھے ایز لانگ از اس کی آنکھیں بند نہیں ہیں اور اس کی آنکھوں پہ پردہ نہیں ہے people who are aware and uh, looking at society and looking at the ways, the path that society is taking. there are uh, people are doing that individually so what is missing is all the awareness coming together you know? i think what mm-hmm. is missing is empathy in a word mm. we say oh it's happening to somebody else and it wasn't like this you know uh, in the 60s when patrice lumumba is murdered the congo leader indian poets indian urdu poets in particular are writing in white heat as though unka ان کے لیے یہ ایک شرم کی بات ہے سو یو ہیو ساہر لودھیانوی رائٹنگ اباؤٹ پیٹرس لومبا سنگ ظلم پھر ظلم ہے بڑھتا ہے تو مٹ جاتا ہے خون آخر خون ہے ٹپکے گا تو جم جائے گا اینڈ وی اسٹل کوٹ دس وی ڈونٹ نو اٹ واز رٹن فار پیٹرس لومبا آج اگر کسی افریقن کنٹری میں کچھ ہوتا ہے افریقہ چھوڑیے یوکرین میں ہو رہا ہے ایک بچہ مارا گیا ہم میں سے کسی نے and yeah we saw it on our on our little tv screens and our mobile phones but that outrage that empathy is missing what caused asai to write a whole ghazal which is still being recited decades later on the murder the execution of patrice lumumba and what stops us from expressing a similar outrage through our pens through our voices whatever we might write a facebook post or we might write a twitter we might tweet something you know uh, it's like uh, like fraz ahmed fraz sitting in beirut editing a literary yeah. magazine and yeah. consistently uh, talking about the plight of the palestinians yeah the idea of common cause of making common cause 
I think that yeah. seems to have gone out of our lives. That, uh, but do you think uh, when uh, when Rashid Jahan, Sajjad Zaheer uh, contributed uh, their uh, thoughts to uh, in Angare, it was a similar uh, situation when individual uh, express their individual concerns about society in one volume, which then in a little while became a mass movement. Look, I, like I said, I think those times were different. I think times were such that people were willing to make common cause with all the big isms of their time. It could be anti-colonialism, anti-fascism, anti-imperialism. It could be feminism, which was just coming into its own, the idea of women being equal uh, partners, uh, the idea of nationalism, which was gathering momentum, the idea of uh, in the years ahead by the 40s, the idea of land reform, whether it was a Tehbaga movement or it was something else. So I think the times were such that the writer, the creative uh, writer, uh, uh, was able to make common cause with these things and say this too. I mean, Khwaja Ahmed Abbas ki thought about biography ka naami hai, I'm not an island. Mm -hmm. So that sums up a mindset. We are sitting on islands today. And this was a generation, the progressives and the others in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s were people who were not sitting on islands. As late as 60s, the Patris Lumo, by example, I love to give at every forum, is very luminous for the simple reason that today we're going to say, Are wo kaum baut dur Africa mein kuch hua tha. you know, it doesn't concern us. Baut dur ki baat kya? Aap hi ke shahar mein hai, agar, agar aap ke khud ke zati saath nahi ho raha hai, to somehow it will not touch you. And this is tragic actually. So we are not able to, to look across the picket fences we've built around ourselves. It could be of language, it could be of politics, it could be of caste, color, creed, what have you. I think we should have done away with those picket fences as a nation. We don't seem to have done that. On that note, knowing now what we are not doing, what we need to do, I thank you, Rakshinda, for 15 books, for 50, more than 50 academic papers, and all your writing and talk about issues of culture, literature, and society. Um, but before you go, I don't know if you feel you've answered this question, but it is again back to Urdu, that eternal concern, that heartbeat stopper question about Urdu, whether the language is alive or really dying. Uh, the language is alive, very much so, everywhere around me. I see people uh, engaged in Urdu in different ways. Uh, the language purists will find faults with their nukhtas and their sheen kafs. The, the grammar uh, puritans will say that, you know, the syntax is all wrong. Uh, सब मुझे बात बोलो सब को मैं तस्लीम करती हूँ हाँ मुमकिन है ये सब चीजें होती हैं लिख तो रहे हैं बोल तो रहे हैं कोशिश तो कर रहे हैं कोशिश भी ना करें और बिल्कुल हाथ खड़े कर दें तब क्या होगा यू नो तो और मैं सिर्फ मुसलमानों की बात नहीं कर रही हूँ बाय द वे व्हेन आई से उर्दू आई � talking about the Muslims. It's not their language. Kerala ke musliman ko urdu bolne ki kya zuhat hai? Bangal ke musliman ko Bangla bole unki madri zabaan hai to mein bilkul bhi mazhab se zabaan ko nahi jor rahi hai. Not at all. I mean jo bad ke paimana utha de isi ka hai. Bilkul. Because there are so many um, departments of Urdu language and literature all over the Western world. And uh, so many Americans and, and, and uh, English people uh, speak such fabulous Urdu. So this is beyond boundaries. This beautiful language is beyond uh, boundaries, beyond religion, caste, and creed. Um, so uh, uh, thank you, Rakshanda, for spending time with thank the speaking citizen. Uh, thank you for everything. Keep writing and we promise to keep reading. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.